Hello. Um, we're going to uh, do a, a kind of a quick review of the lecture we had uh, recently uh, at the beginning of the semester about modern sculpture. Uh, the curriculum this semester for sculpture classes uh, is going to follow a lot of modern uh, uh, sculptures uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, most projects are going to have something to do with uh, some of the artists. So, uh, what I wanted to do was kind of give a really quick, really quick overview of some of the artists during the 20th century and some of the things they did. What's really, really interesting about the 20th century is that thinking completely changes. Just the whole, everything is so different than it has ever been. And it's really exhilarating to really understand the, the thought processes that start happening in the 20th century. <clears throat> For thousands of years, artwork had been very linear. It had been very methodical on how it evolved. <clears throat> and, and some of the artists like in the Renaissance, yeah, you made up these, you had these new rules, but there's still rules that everyone lived by. And the better you live by those rules, the generally the better the artist you were. Uh, but when it comes to the 20th century, things are going to change so so radically and so fast uh, that it, uh, it's not going to be so linear anymore. It's going to be more of an explosion and then other explosions that are going to be happening. <clears throat> it's basically going to be uh, a lot of thought process is what's so important about it. So here we're talking about Augustin Rodin. Now, Rodin is... Uh, is known to be the father of modern, father of modern sculpture, and again, I'm going to do some, some fairly quick. Uh, here's a piece he did in the 1860s. It was just a portrait of a man. You got to realize with bronze sculpture, uh, a lot of them are, are done in plaster, but most of them are done in clay. So you got the soft clay, and then you work with it, and then you get a plaster mold of it. So you have your original clay. Then you make a mold of it. You take the clay away, which is often destroyed, and then you put metal into it and you cast uh, the original clay in bronze in this case. And, and how that's done is a little more complicated than that, but basically that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> and what happened with this piece is, is Rodin uh, was doing sculpture and he doesn't ever say why, but he, uh, he got his thumb and he pushed it into the nose of the figure right here. So it's called Man with a Broken Nose. So this is the first time that the human form is deliberately distorted uh, to create a different thought or feeling. And that's what happens with Man with a Broken Nose. That is actually done, and it was not till 20 years later that people could be accepting the change in sculpture. Uh, Rodin, and I've got some really cool stories about this particular sculpture that I'm trying to talk about today. And he's the one that we recognize that did the thinker which is on the gates of, uh, which is on the gates of hell. Uh, this is a piece right here. It's in U on the UCLA campus in Los Angeles. Uh, this will show you, uh, this, this brings out a lot of what 20th century sculpture is gonna do. So here we have Walking Man and Rodin is, he, he is skilled enough to anatomically correctly uh, sculpt people. Matter of fact, there was a, a situation where he was sculpting people, uh, sculptures, and he was accused by critics of actually casting real people and then casting them in bronze. And he said, no, I'm not doing them, I'm actually building them out of raw, out of clay. And they didn't believe him. So they really slammed him in the newspapers. So he uh, invited all those critics to come by a studio. They sat there all day while he built a piece. Uh, I think it was Adam that he did. And they can see how, he, how good he really was. So here's this is what's interesting. This piece right here, see the bottom half, very realistic, just like he can do. But then as he goes up into the torso area, you'll see where his hands grip the clay and scratched it to bring out the ribs. Matter of fact, <clears throat> when you build a sculpture out of clay, you have to build an armature. Because if that's a soft clay, it would just fall down. The weight of it would just collapse it. So what happens, you build a wooden armature underneath, or sometimes a metal armature, but usually wooden. And so you have these pieces of wood <clears throat> that are inside there. And what happens is when he, when he gets the torso and he leans it forward because it's walking, it actually pulls away from the wooden armature in the back. And then Rodin, he, 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 he does a 
push the armature back in there. He leaves the armature sticking out. You see where his fist hunch uh, the back to move it forward a little bit. You can actually see how the artist is actually making it work. And, and, that's a, and that was a pretty interesting uh, jump leap in, uh, in art history when artists did that. But this is Walking Man. It's actually an incredible piece. Uh, Rodin was commissioned to do a, a door to a museum of modern art. And the museum was never built, but he worked on the doors most of his career. And you'll see that there's so the thinker right here. There's other figures here, figures throughout this entire doorway. If you were standing there, you'd be about this tall. It's a fairly large door. And, uh, but many of the figures that are in his career are also implemented into the doors. Uh, again, Rodin, the father of modern sculpture. Uh, what Rodin also did was with these doors is he modeled them after the gates of paradise uh, in Florence, Italy. Uh, the earlier uh, versions of this had segments, panels, like the early doors did, but those panels were evolved. And this is the, the gates of paradise, is the gates of hell. Uh, what happened was bronze sculpture had been a lost art. Uh, the Greeks did it, but then when the Roman Empire came in, they didn't like the bronze as much as the marble, and it kind of went out of style, so they forgot how to do it. And then Donatello during the Renaissance, when Leonardo da Vinci was doing the Mona Lisa over here, uh, Donatello was down the street uh, doing people anatomically correct in bronze sculpture. He figured out how to do the bronze sculpture. And then during the Baroque period, bronze became very out of style again, and it was a lost art. And then Rodin, <clears throat> will will leave uh, France, go to Italy, and he'll study how to do bronze sculpture. And he's going to resurrect this bronze sculpture technique, which is still being done today. Uh, Rodin uh, <clears throat> was married uh, to a very politically correct woman and helped him get a lot of different things. But he had a helper that was with him, and his name, her name was Camille Claudel. And she in some way surpassed him uh, as far as sculpture. But they had an affair for many, many years and she wanted him to divorce his wife and marry her and he refused and she went, she lost her mind. She destroyed her artwork and she lived the last 30 years of her life in an asylum. But what's really neat about it where Rodin was very comfortable in what he was doing, she pushed it beyond there. She's gonna give it more movement. She's going to have more feelings and emotions in the work. And her work is just absolutely, absolutely beautiful, her work. And there's not a lot of it around. A lot of it was destroyed. She destroyed a lot of it. But Camille um, but Claudel, I think, is the greatest female artist of all time. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe in painting and drawing. And Camille Claudel, as far as sculpture, was incredibly talented. Uh, one of my favorite artists is Brancusi. And Brancusi would simplify shapes and forms to the most simple, beautiful state. So he took something that was realistic and every year he did it over and over and over and over again. And every year it got simpler and more streamlined. And he called it more beautiful. Like for instance, this here is a crying child, a newborn, where you have the hairline right here the hairline and the open mouth and the tongue right here with the mouth head back crying. Now here's a real good example. There was a, there was a bird. He took the bird and he made this from it. So he simplified the real bird to this. And here you have the mouth and the eyes and neck, the torso, the legs and the wings. And then he takes this and he does it again. You see how it's streamlined. It's gone from this to this. You still have the open mouth, the neck, the torso, and the wings, but it's now grown. Instead of it being, you know, a foot and a half, it's now two and a half feet, almost three feet tall. And then he does it again. He does, he'll do this piece, I don't know how many times, 20, 30 times. And uh, this is the final uh, burden space right here. So this one here is about seven, eight feet tall. Uh, so what he's done is he's taken realistic things and he's approached pure abstract art. Pure abstract art has, has no reference to anything. It didn't evolve from anything. So this isn't abstract. Is this evolved from a bird? 
But pure abstract art is like pure organic form. It doesn't represent anything. It didn't fall from anything. It doesn't look like anything. But this comes right to the brink of it. And then we have another, a guy named Gene Arp. He's going to do pure abstract art. And then there's going to be artists that are going to pull away from abstract art. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, like we have talked about, if you had me last semester, we talked about uh, Marcel Duchamp. <clears throat> now, Marcel Duchamp is going to get to the apex. He's going to be the height of Cubist painting. Uh, Picasso, <clears throat> 1905, 1906, is going to be the first Cubist painter. But Marcel Duchamp is going to come around and he's going to achieve the highest levels of, of uh, popularity in Cubist painting by 1912, 13, 14. So what happens is if, if you were in Paris and you liked Marcel Duchamp, you didn't like you know, what the common people kind of like, you know, people that know much about art, they kind of liked impressionism and post-impressionism because that, that was still kind of lingering on. And that's what people started to like and accept. But if you were a Cubist artist, so instead of dealing with the exterior form, you're looking at the interior volume of a piece. That's what Cubists are doing. I'm not talking about Cubism today. I'm just basically saying that Marcel Duchamp becomes the top Cubist artist in Paris. And it was a very cutting edge art period. Uh, it was uh, only the people that really were into art really got Cubism. So what happened was Marcel Duchamp, he had uh, his Cubist paintings up and and cutting edge people came to the cutting edge show to see the Cubist work. And then Mar Marcel Duchamp had this sitting on the wall. He went to a hardware store, he picked up a snow shovel, put a nail on the wall and hung it up on the wall. And then he entitled it with a little nameplate says, an advance of a broken arm. So when people came to this, it just really shocked them. I mean, they were scraping gray matter off the ceiling. It really freaked everybody out. And then he also had you know, uh, the bottle dryer. Uh, when you clean your bottles in the sink uh, 100 years ago, you don't want that residue to, to, to dry on the bottom. So you turn the bottles upside down, or your bottle, your, your cups or your glasses, your bottles. And this is a dryer for, uh, for glassware. And, uh, and these are ready-mades. This is gonna be very important because these things are gonna happen later on also. So what happens is Marcel Duchamp is, is saying that, yes, I'm a cubist artist, but now he's saying anything could be art. You know, in 1905, Henry Matisse said, cows don't have to be brown. They can be purple. Okay. And that's what Matisse was saying just before this. And now what Marcel Duchamp is saying is uh, artwork doesn't have to be an object of art that an artist makes. You can take something from the real world and take it from the real world and put it on a pedestal. And you can now count that art. And again, the whole philosophy of what art possibly can be is now changing very, very rapidly. Uh, and this was, uh, and this was uh, Marcel Duchamp here, and he signed this piece, R. Mutt, uh, 1917. It was called The Fountain. Uh, there's a lot I can say about him. He's, he's probably my favorite sculptor. I can go on and on about Marcel Duchamp. Uh, I want to try to get through this uh, here for you quickly. Uh, at, at the same time, about 19, 17, 20, 21, 22, uh, we have Max Ernst. And Max Ernst is, again, everyone I'm talking about is taking art to a, to a place that's never been before. Max Ernst, what he's going to do is he's going to what we call uh, uh, do Dada. Uh, Dada was a pure, random art period. And <clears throat> what I mean, if you take a look here, here's a painting of, of a building, a hand coming out of the building, holding you know, a, a walnut with, with a thing going through his fingers and a walnut and an arrow. And <clears throat> you have two birds down here with a human eye with a fence and horns and a string going up an air balloon in the background. <clears throat> what happens is these are random images put together. Matter of fact, if he said it made any sense, he usually would cut them out of the image. And, <coughs> and that's what Max Ernst was doing. So he did a sculpture, this at the Nelson Art Gallery. And here we have a portrait of a family with just random objects uh, doing it. Uh, Max Ernst is, 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 is going to 
do this random period. I said, we call it data because he actually got a dictionary and fanned the pages of the dictionary, fanned the pages by, and he put his finger, boom, like this, because he wanted to get a, a, if it's a random art period, he wanted to have a random name for it. He didn't want to call it the random art period because that's not very random. That's dead straight on what it is. So he's, he's, he, he fanned the pages, put his finger down on the book, and it came on Dada, the word Dada. And the word Dada means a hobby horse. Like we have a carousel with horses on it. If you take the pole off and you put it in your house and you have this pole with this plastic horse on it, that's a hobby horse. That's Dada in German. And it is the, the name of this random art period got a random name. Uh, that's going to evolve into some other things also. <clears throat> because with the random art period, uh, if you take it just one little step to the side, instead of it being random, if you make it come from the subconscious mind, which is very random in your head, but still the information's there. Uh, if it's from the subconscious mind, that goes into surrealism. And surrealism becomes huge with Salvador Dali and other surreal artists. So Max Ernst, by doing Dada, gave birth to a massive art period, surrealism, that'll be coming right after this. <laughs> so uh, by, by changing the thought process of what's going on, uh, a lot of very interesting things are gonna happen. Uh, we have Alexander Calder uh, in the 1930s. He's gonna depict the fact that a wire is a three-dimensional line. If you draw a line on a piece of paper, it's just two-dimensional. But if you have a wire and you do it in space, you now have this line going through the air, going through space, and it's a three-dimensional line. And that's what he's done here. Uh, he does the wire sculptures. He will do uh, large uh, uh, mobiles. This is a small one. I've seen them four stories tall, these big metal mobiles. And when the air conditioning blows, the wind blows, they move around. Uh, they're quite beautiful. They fill this beautiful space. Uh, and also in Kansas City, we have, this one's not the one in Kansas City, but the one in Kansas City down at Crown Center looks almost exactly like this one. And the one in Crown Center is a little more orange than this red. And that's Alexander Call there also. And talking about Kansas City, we have uh, Klaus Oldenburg. And Klaus Oldenburg is going to uh, give us a shuttlecock, which are everyday things are made objects of art. So here we have 1994, but then in 1914, uh, you know, 80 years earlier, you had uh, 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 Marcel Duchamp taking you know, the snow shovel in advance of a broken arm. Well, here we are all these years later, and Klaus Oldenburg takes these objects of art, and then he makes them larger. Uh, the, uh, regular objects in life, and makes them objects of art by making them much larger. And he is going to do things like the Stroom Bridge in Minneapolis and Philadelphia and in Barcelona. Uh, when my wife and I travel off and we travel to country uh, cities that have one of the sculptures and we take pictures uh, with them. Uh, we're going to talk about this later on this semester. Okay, then we remember we talked about uh, how Brancusi was approaching abstract art. Well, then I told you some artists go away from abstract art. So what happens is, as, as, as artists were approaching abstract art, their work was looking more and more less recognizable as it got to abstract. And then as it pulls away from abstract, this is 1935. So as it pulls away from abstract, artists in the beginning of their careers, their work doesn't, you don't recognize it very much. And toward the end of their careers, they're more recognizable as human form. And that's the case with Henry Moore. Early in his career, that's a human form. But then you'll see as, as, as his career goes on, the piece will look more realistic and then more realistic. And then you get to the 1980s and you have super realism sculptures where this woman here, the custodian, that's the sculpture. These are two people looking at the sculptures. Here's a sculpture here. What's really cool about uh, Dwayne Hansen in Kansas City is, Kansas, this is a police officer, but Kansas City has a museum guard as their sculpture. So when you go to a museum, a really nice museum, usually there's a guard in each room, a museum worker in each room. 
when you walk into this modern sculpture room, you go in there, there's a museum guard, but he's actually a piece of artwork. And uh, it's really kind of cool when you go down to Nelson to see him. And this again is one of his sculptures put in an environment. And then we have Donald Judd. Donald Judd was, uh, was born just down the street from where I live right here, but he was born in the 1920s. And um, Donald Judd, what he established in art history is that any shape or form or color can be objects of art. So artists, again, are raising, raising the ceiling on what the possibilities of what art can be. And Donald Judd's ideas gave birth to massive art movements in Japan, in Germany, and throughout the world in the second half of the 20th century. And this piece here is, is just down at the Nelson Art Gallery. And you'll see how his pieces are very simple. He's the leader of a minimalist movement, very, very minimal. Uh, Robert Smithen uh, did the spiral jetty, which is in the Great Salt Lake. Let's look in the other direction. He took a copper mine. He did a design of the base of a copper mine that had been closed. And, uh, and that's uh, another large sculpture he did. And this is a piece he did in the lake. Uh, was moving some some earth. So Robert Smith does site installations by actually he gets mountains and actually cuts bees in the mountains that line up with each other. So you can visually look at it and see these bees all cut up. Uh, he even cut some mountains up to where it'd be in a plane and the plane would line up with these cuts and these different mountains as you look across the mountainscape. Uh, so he did some large, uh, large, large things like that. And we have Luis Nevelson. She, uh, what she's doing is she's establishing a sculpture of that. This is a sculpture right here. But also, this is a sculpture. That's a sculpture. This is a sculpture. So is this, and so is that, so is that, so is that. So the sculptures are entirety, entirety as a piece, and there's a bunch of little sculptures that together they make a larger sculpture. And she's was working with that design. Another one of her pieces. And then we have like guys like Nam Gabo. Uh, Nam Gabo. And you'll see he's a cubist sculptor. And what's happening is like with cubism, with painting and drawing, they want to look at the interior of the form as the sculpture. And you can see here where you don't have any surface, you only have the interior. And what that does. And we're not going to get into it right now, but what that does, it gives you an increased sense of depth of feel in the artwork. If you look at it, it looks like it's larger, deeper than it really is. And uh, Nam Gabo did some amazing pieces around 1920. And Jacques Lipschitz with Picasso is also going to be a, a, a cubist uh, sculptor, again, bringing out heightened sense of depth. Also interior with, with lip ships doing the interior. Uh, G. Kmeti, uh, he's known for making these tall, really tall, skinny individuals. Some are stories tall and some are small and those are nice groupings. Uh, Dwayne Hansen, no, Joseph Cornell, Joseph Cornell, what he does, he gets a box and creates a sculpture in that environment. So whatever the size of that box is, that's the that's his sculpture, that volume. And here, this piece at the Nelson Art Gallery, I love this piece, <coughs> has these dancing lobsters and these knives and forks dangling above their heads on a stage. <coughs> and this was really kind of a fun piece. Uh, another piece he did following the other one with the lobsters and the dancers dancing together. <coughs> we'll, be, we'll be doing a box sculpture during this semester. And here we have just another one of uh, his box sculptures. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to just take a moment to do at, at the end of this is to do uh, the, to show show you uh, Chris Kurtz. He's a contemporary artist. He does artwork today. <clears throat> uh, he was a student of mine from 1990 to 1994, and uh, he went off to Art Institute and went off to uh, Alfred Art uh, Alfred College. Uh, he does wood sculpture, and I had him every semester uh, 
for his four years in college and high school. Uh, he went to the Art Institute and it, it, Chris's work ethic is like no one I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, he would work on things all night long, <clears throat> literally come to school and not even gone to sleep yet. You know, and you say, well, that's not that big a deal. Uh, but, but Chris's work uh, is just absolutely phenomenal what he does. Uh, when he went to the Art Institute in the, in the school newspaper, <clears throat> he was interviewed and he said in the school newspaper that he dared any professor in the school to give him an A minus on anything that he does. He said, I dare him. What I'm doing is better than anybody else. And I don't deserve an A minus on anything. And he never did get an A minus. He was there for a couple of years and he transferred to Alfred, which is a nicer, a really nice uh, sculpture school. But he, um, he even told the newspaper that he learned more from his, Mr. Bowen, his art teacher in high school. And he learned from any of the professors. So when I'd go to art shows and, I'd, and people would introduce themselves to me and I'd say, yeah, I'm Keith Bowen. They go, oh, you're, oh, you're Mr. Bowen. <laughs> Because he, he often criticized that he learned more in high school than he did in college, and they didn't push him. And he had and he pushed himself. And you'll see he does wood sculptures, but he does functional wood sculpture and non-functional wood sculpture. Here's a functional piece. It's a swing. It's made out of wood. But then he makes a non-functional chair. He has a functional chair made out of wood. That's not a cushion. And then when he had a little baby girl, he built her a high chair and here's another sculpture this thing's about uh about seven eight feet tall but what he what he does is he does these beautiful wood sculptures uh this one right here i think was the one that was bought for by, by sprint uh i think it was eighty thousand dollars uh i know glass who owned the royals had a, a sculpture of his in his home and uh it just, just sells very expensive and sells artwork all over the world. Uh, but what I'm saying is, it's just, uh, another, I happen to know him fairly well. He stops by and sees me whenever he's in town. Uh, his mom lives down the street still. His father just passed away. But uh, uh, it, it's really, uh, really neat to see him have art shows uh, from New York to San Francisco to Kansas City and just see how hard he works and how good he does at what he does. Uh, Anyway, so uh, that's a really good smattering of, uh, of, of modern sculpture. Technically, modern sculpture goes from man with a broken nose in, in 18, uh, mid 1860s all the way to about 1953. So when you think of modern sculpture, it actually ends in 1953 before I was even born. And now we have contemporary, we have other things, we have pop, we have different things that happened since then. But uh, I'd probably like to talk about 20th century sculpture because it actually encompasses modern and surreal and data and uh, ready-made and site installations and things like that. So it encompasses a larger brand when you say 20th century. So this semester we're gonna, we're gonna talk a lot about 20th century sculpture, our projects are gonna reflect it. And, um, uh, and thank you very much, appreciate it.